Hi, welcome to the Yellow Wallpaper Chronicles. I'm your host, Siren, and the personality behind the Runaway Siren 940 YouTube channel. This podcast seeks to discuss topics that few are brave enough to touch, from gender ideology to prostitution and the inevitable consequence of the rise of misogyny. Our episodes delve into the intersections of gender, society, and power, offering a radical feminist perspective that aims to unravel the complexities of the modern world. Yellow Wallpaper Chronicles is your compass for a transformative exploration of gender-critical and radical feminist ideas, aiming to spark conversations that resonate beyond the confines of traditional discourse. Do I understand your position to be that there are two sexes, but there can be more than two genders? Um, I wouldn't even say two, and you know we've got Dr. Lopez here as well, but there's also the definition of intersex. I think that often these conversations were conflating sex and gender, and I do want to affirm here that trans women are are women. That is their gender. They're like, oh, we respect Leah as a woman, as a trans woman, whatever. We respect her identity. We just don't think it's fair. You can't really have that that sort of half support where you're like, oh, I respect her as a woman here, but not here. They're using the guise uh, of feminism to sort of push transphobic uh, beliefs. And I think a lot of people in that camp sort of carry an implicit bias against trans people, but don't want to, I guess, fully manifest or, or speak that out. And so they try to just play it off as this sort of half support. To be honest, like for me, the, the, the people that I saw, the first images that really struck a chord with me were, you know, uh, trans women and pornography. And, um, there was something that um, unlocked in my brain that I saw these uh, wonderful, fearless performers um, becoming these, um, becoming desirable. I play a lot of other roles in my life over my life. I've played the role of teacher, actor, preacher, poet, even stand up comedian. But the role that I am most proud to play for you today is the role of woman. The American Revolution centered upon ideals of equality and freedom from the tyranny of British rule. However, John Locke's idea of inalienable rights of life, liberty, and property were only applied to a select few upon the conception of the United States as a sovereign state. Notably, slavery was booming, and warfare against both Mexicans and Native Americans continued to be funded by the state and federal governments. Even from the start, women were fighting for the right to be treated as full human beings and to be considered equal to men. In 1776, Abigail Adams wrote to her husband, Remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men will be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Not long after, 300 people attended the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. Elizabeth Cady Stanton gave a speech noting that the purpose of the assembly was to protest against a form of government existing without the consent of the governed, to declare our right to be free as man is free, to be represented in the government which we are taxed to support, to have such disgraceful laws as give men the power to chastise and imprison his wife, to take the wages that she earns, the property which she inherits, and, in case of separation, the children of her love. It was at this meeting that 11 unanimous resolutions were passed. The only resolution which was not unanimous was the need for the right to vote, which was later recognized as crucial to enshrining women's rights to anything else, from divorce to owning property. Every goal of women's liberation has been achieved through hard-fought activism. Nothing was handed over easily, and every victory required a sacrifice of blood, sweat, and tears, and often, lives. Women did not receive the right to vote until 1920, when the 19th Amendment was passed. However, until the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, women of color or in poverty often were unable to exercise that right. It wasn't until 1974, when the Equal Credit Opportunity Act passed, that women were allowed to open bank accounts on their own. It took until the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978 for it to be explicitly illegal to fire a woman for being pregnant or having related health conditions. Even the choice to wear pants instead of a skirt required much work, and it wasn't until 1923 that women received the legal right to wear trousers, though restrictions on clothing remained until relatively recently. 
Although Elizabeth Smith Miller and other suffragettes enjoyed the freedom that bloomers offered in comparison to the restrictive clothing required of their time, they had to abandon the effort due to the pushback they received, which made it difficult to focus on other goals. Similarly, today the women's rights movement has been stymied by opposition which seeks to undo many of these victories in the name of progressivism through denial of the existence of women as a definable and oppressed class. Can you provide a definition for the word woman? Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. You can't? N not in okay. this context. So I'm not a biologist. The meaning of the word woman is so unclear and controversial that you can't give me a definition? Yeah, a woman is somebody whose internal perception aligns with what we culturally view as being feminine. That's why wearing clothing, talking a certain way, fitting into a certain role does not determine whether or not you are a woman. That's also why experience does not determine whether or not you are a woman. It comes down to an internal perception you have of yourself. Define what what a woman is. Mr. Chairman, yep. there are people who identify women. as different genders who are capable of getting identity. pregnant. That is my position on this. I am not going to feed more into the bigotry of that question. The gay rights movement is somewhat younger than the fight for women's liberation in the United States. As the first documented gay rights organization was the Society for Human Rights, which was established in 1924. Although disbanded shortly after its inception, it marked the beginning of the fight to be viewed as just a normal deviation of human sexuality. Over the next century, concerted efforts were made by homosexuals to eliminate discrimination, derision, prejudice, and bigotry, to assimilate homosexuals into mainstream society, and to cultivate the notion of an ethical homosexual culture. These efforts were often intertwined with other activist causes, such as interracial marriage, disability rights, and feminism. Just as feminism was a slow and drawn-out war, so too was the fight to normalize homosexuality. In 1962, Illinois repealed its anti-sodomy laws. In 1969, biracial lesbian Stormy DeLovery instigated the Stonewall Riot, which was commemorated with the first Pride Parade the following year, which was co-founded by Fred Sargent and three other activists. In 1973, the APA removed homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses. Much of early activism stemmed around preventing discrimination, such as being fired or denied employment or housing for being homosexual, repealing laws which made homosexual activity criminal, seeking recognition for partnerships, and eventually, for the right to marriage. These goals were chosen due to the material reality of being gay. Homosexuals often faced violence, discrimination, and hatred, which made life, liberty, and happiness an impossibility. The rights they sought were rights that many minority couples also wanted, ones which no one would consider to be privileges or different from what the majority already had. In 2015, Obergefell v. Hodges legalized gay marriage nationally, and many gay rights organizations shift their focus to a new goal, the normalization of transgenderism. It took roughly 200 years for women's rights to reach relative equality. It took 100 years for homosexuality to be mostly accepted. It's taken 10 years for trans rights activism to overtake both movements. Today, men are able to compete in women's sports and are able to serve prison sentences in women's prisons. Women have been arrested, fired, and blacklisted for accurately describing a person's sex. Gender identity has usurped sex and law, and a suppression of criticism has made it difficult to offer informed consent to those seeking to transition. This rapid growth prompts us to question, what makes a trans rights movement so different from other social movements? How has this movement's rise to power impacted women's rights and safety? And what does this mean for the future of feminism and gay liberation? Join me as we explore the trans movement, the ideology that drives it, and its impact on the world around us. In today's episode, we are going to discuss what gender identity and ideology is, a broad overview of the critiques against it, and how language has been used to provide legitimacy and power to the movement. Before we go any further, it's important to ask, what exactly is gender identity? What exactly is gender identity? I'm glad you asked. Gender identity is separate from our assigned sex at birth. 
And our gender identity is our internal knowing of ourselves. It's about how we experience our own gender. There are almost infinite ways for folks to experience their own gender identity, and they're all awesome and valid. What makes a gender identity valid is that it's sincere, is that it's in good faith. So if somebody is in good faith believing that they're a woman, like somebody who's a trans woman, it's like, okay, you know what? I know I'm trans, I know that I'm a woman, and they know that deep down that they're a woman to me. Absolutely, I'll call them she, her. Wikipedia defines it as being the personal sense of one's own gender. Planned Parenthood advises that your gender identity is how you feel inside and how you express those feelings. The Human Rights Campaign is a bit more detailed and defines gender as being one's innermost concept of self as male, female, a blend of both, or neither. How individuals perceive themselves and what they call themselves. At the outset, you'll notice these definitions can be classified into two categories. Circular and absurd. However, before I comment on that further, let's discuss what gender is. The Cambridge Dictionary defines gender as being a group of people in a society who share particular qualities or ways of behaving which that society associates with being male, female, or another identity. Oxford English Dictionary notes that it is the state of being male or female as expressed by social or cultural distinctions and differences, rather than biological ones. The collective of attributes or traits associated with a particular sex or determined as a result of one's sex. From an anthropological and feminist perspective, I prefer to note Oxford references distinction that sex is the biological category, whereas gender is the culturally shaped expression of sexual difference, the masculine way in which men should behave and the feminine way in which women should behave. So, to return to Wikipedia's definition, if we replace gender with the definition of gender, what you get is gender identity is the personal sense of one's own collective attributes or traits associated with a particular sex or determined as a result of one's sex. When you break down the definition in this way, you'll realize gender identity is the identification with stereotypes assigned to a person based on their sex. As defined in Britacana, a circular argument is a logical fallacy in which the premise of an argument assumes the conclusion to be true. For example, you must follow the law because breaking the law is illegal, or kale is good for you because it is healthy, or trans women are women. These arguments assume that what is it attempting to prove is true and doesn't provide any other proof to support this conclusion. This fallacy can be seen in circular definitions, which rely on the use of the world that is being defined in the definition. So, woman is defined by Cambridge Dictionary as an adult who lives and identifies as female, though they may have been said to be have a different sex at birth. Susan Stryker, a trans woman writing for Times Magazine, argues that women are an imagined community that honors the female, enacts the feminine, and exceeds the limitations of a sexist society. Women are multifaceted, intergenerational, international, limitless, formless. Women are the world, says American model and trans woman Erin Phillip. A woman is anyone who identifies as a woman, is an oft-quoted definition on social media or in real-life discussions on the topic. You'll notice that the definition of woman is more often debated than the definition of man. This is of interest, as while more males continue to identify as transgender than females, there has been an increasing number of gender dysphoric individuals seeking hormonal therapy and an accompanying steady rise in the number of female to male, such that the incidence now equals that of male to female transsexuals. In other words, since there is a large number of females who identify as male, you might expect the definition of man to also be under the bait. However, most conversations center around the definition of woman and the ability of the word to include men who identify as female. As a result of wanting to include any and everyone who wishes to identify in a certain way, the definitions provided for gender identity, woman, man, or any other gender-related term, must not be limiting. This results in definitions that are circular and willfully vague, such as gender identity being self-defined and nonspecific feelings, or a person's internal sense of gender. Or, definitions become absurd, as how can a male identify as a female when the two are mutually exclusive experiences? Unfortunately, there is no clear definition of what gender ideology is, though one can recognize it in the legal changes to accommodate gender identity, the treatments made to better align one's physical body with their gender identity, and the push to ignore biological sex in favor of gender identity. As a feminist, my definition would be, 
Gender ideology is the view that biological sex and gender, referring to the culturally shaped expression of sexual difference, can be incongruent, and that gender is more inclusive, encompassing, and important than biological sex, in all fields from academia, medicine, to law and more. Through an adherence to this view, sexism, homophobia, and general anti-intellectualism are furthered in opposition to feminism, gay rights, rationalism, and logic. All of this may seem relatively irrelevant. After all, most people are not using a dictionary on a daily basis. However, the impact of this way of thinking is long-reaching, starting with our ability to talk about gender or gender ideology at all. You might not advertise that you listen to this podcast. You probably won't share it with your coworkers or play it on road trips or buy merchandise that explicitly states, this is a gender critical podcast. And I can't say that I blame you. Despite many people, male and female, liberal and conservative, and crossing any other political divide you can imagine, agreeing about the importance of single-sex spaces, of being able to freely talk about female experiences and female oppression, about the silliness of pretending that biological sex is not a real thing, or the unfairness of allowing men to identify as women and to access scholarships, jobs, and awards meant for women. Many are unable or unwilling to say so aloud out of fear of retribution. Perhaps the most famous example of this is Maya Forstater, who as of 2022 was finally recognized for being unfairly fired for referring to a non-binary identified man as he. Her case caught the attention of J.K. Rowling, whose tweeted response was announced as being transphobic, and has led to one of the greatest campaigns of hatred towards a single individual that continues today. The so-called transphobic tweet in question? Dress however you please, call yourself whatever you like. Sleep with any consenting adult who will have you. Live your best life in peace and security. But force women out of their jobs for stating that sex is real? Hashtag, I stand with Maya. Hashtag, this is not a drill. Most people who face retribution like this are unable to weather the storm. Rowling's unique position of wealth allowed her to have the safety net required to continue to speak her mind, though many would have, and have already, folded under the pressure of a very loud and very online minority. In 2015, two Texas daycare teachers were fired for misgendering a preschool student and raising concerns about the confusion the students often changing gender identity caused for other students. In the same year, a Michigan woman had her Planet Fitness membership revoked for complaining about a trans woman in the woman's changing room. Similar events have happened across the U.S., where in women's complaints of men intruding into female bathrooms, changing rooms, and other spaces have led to the removal and villainization of the woman and not the intruding man, even if his presence has been proved to be malignant. Take, for example, the Wee Spa incident in California in 2021. L.A. County D.A.'s office has filed charges against the person accused of uh, indecent exposure in a woman's locker room at a Los Angeles spa. You may remember the incident back in June touched off protests outside the Wee Spa in Koreatown over transgender rights. Police identified the person involved as 52-year-old Darren Moreger of Riverside County. Moreger, who has been a registered sex offender since 2006, now faces five felony counts of indecent exposure. Moreger, who claims to identify as a female, also faces charges from another locker room incident in 2018 and has a long criminal history. A man entered the women's section of the spa where women and girls were nude and enjoying the facilities. He was initially defended by the trans community until police noted his previous convictions and his sex offender status. At the time of the incident, many left-wing sources claimed that it was a hoax meant to stir up transphobia and bigoted fears. But in the time after, few news sources reported on the updated information, which proved that this was not the case. We Spa could do little about it at the time, as in California, gender identity is a protected class, even if it directly conflicts with the rights a person has based on their sex. The broadest form of coercion within gender ideology is the control of language. Not only will one face social consequences for refusing to use language in the way trans activists prescribe, but they can face legal ones as well. New York City has criminalized misgendering a trans person by labeling accurately referring to a person's sex a discriminatory act, which can result in civil penalties of up to $125,000 for violations of the law and, in extreme circumstances, of up to $250,000 for violations that are the result of willful, wanton, or malicious conduct. 
The attorney who assisted in the prosecution of transgender child molester Hannah Tubbs had been suspended from his role by the district attorney's office after being accused of misgendering and deadnaming Tubbs. Tubbs, age 26, sexually assaulted a 10-year-old girl and received only two years in a youth residential facility as a result, which the attorney disagreed with both because he was no longer a youth and for the depravity of the crime. Derek Jensen, an author, was disinvited from Oregon State University over transphobia and wrote a response in which he stated, A few months ago, I was deplatformed from speaking at Oregon State University. The professors who deplatformed me said it was because my speaking at the university could hurt the feelings of the students who identify as transgender. This is because I do not believe that women, including those who have been sexually assaulted by men, should be forced to share their most vulnerable spaces with men. I do not believe that women should be forced to bathe, sleep, gather, or organize with men unless they chose to do so. For this, I was deplatformed. Julie Bendel, a notable feminist writer and activist, has been deplatformed multiple times for her views. In a speech regarding those experiences, she noted, Then when I would go to universities, invited by staff rather than the NUS because, of course, the NUS no platform me, and make sure that other student bodies lose their funding for me if they invite me. I would go on to campus. For example, last time I was at Essex University, I was invited to debate a pornographer. And the usual petition, I must say that change.org has really benefited from this row. This online petition thing, I mean, they are so busy with it all, went around. Ban Julie Bendel from campus. Her presence on campus for Muslim students, queer students, bi students, polyamorous students, sex working students, and trans students will be an act of violence. This is all online for you to see. I don't even need to exaggerate, which is breaking my heart because that is what I love doing more than anything. You'll note the presentation of dissent as an act of violence, a common trend regarding this topic. There are a myriad of other examples too many to list, from campus vagina monologues being canceled for being about vaginas, and therefore exclusive to trans women, to debates about transgender or gay rights excluding women and lesbians, to the dissolution of Mitchfest and other female-only festivals. Those who accurately report on trans issues, namely by noting that biological sex is real and immutable, have been punished in silence for doing so. And yet, you'll notice that there have been no similar punishments for the hateful and violent speech used against those who disagree with gender ideology. This, of course, is not always directed at women or lesbians, but rather anyone with concerns about the conflation of gender with stereotypes, which in turn can include conservatives, liberals, and apolitical men and women. Truly, it impacts anyone who is still willing to stand by logic and fact, that there are only two sexes, two zygotes, ova and sperm, and therefore only two genders, which in turn reflect the roles and expectations placed upon them. It seems as if this concept of free speech itself is under fire, and more so, science itself. The use of social media and groupthink to spread misinformation and to discourage individual or critical thought is why people like JKR are so easily vilified. Few can actually name what she supposedly said that was transphobic, and when one actually reads the tweets, they are surprisingly tame. Similar to the future that 1984 predicted and hoped to warn against, we are living in a society in which one must agree that 2 plus 2 equals 5, or else face punishment from within our social circles, from our jobs and colleges, and even from the law. If it were true that trans-identified individuals were a minority in need of protection, who face undue oppression and hatred, then why are they the ones who determine how women talk about their oppression and experiences? Why has the rest of the world bowed down to their preferred word usage, changing the way we speak to better help support their belief that sex can be changed and that gender is a matter of choice? Here's a better question. What is a TERF? What is a TERF? TERFs, or trans-exclusionary radical feminists, believe that in order to be a woman, you need to have been assigned female at birth or a biological woman. They don't believe that trans women are women and they see them as a threat to womanhood, which is why they oppose trans women in women's only spaces like women's restrooms and women's sports. This belief continues to further endanger trans women in a society that already tells them they're not valid. It creates more noise and misinformation surrounding them, which fosters violence and hatred. What's a TERF? 
I'm so glad you asked. So a TERF is an acronym that stands for a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. Now don't let the name fool you. They're actually not feminists. They're actually the stain of the feminist movement because they're anti-men. Now how do you recognize a TERF? Because of course a piece of shit never likes to be called what it is. You look for people saying kill all men or rad femmes, radical feminists, or some of the weirder ones, adult female or XX female. Now I'm all for women supporting women, but if you insist on calling yourself a female, then baby, I'm going to be the first to start digging six feet down. The term was first used in 2008 by Viv Smith, a self-described cishet woman who ran a feminist blog. On August 17th, 2008, Smith wrote a blog post announcing TERFs, the first use of the term, in regards to the internet discussions on gender identity going on amongst other feminist bloggers, where she wrote, I am aware that this decision is likely to affront some trans-exclusionary radical feminists, TERFs, but it must be said. Marginalizing trans women at actual risk from regularly documented abuse slash violence in favor of protecting hypothetical cis women from purely hypothetical abuse slash violence from trans women and women-only safe spaces strikes me as horribly unethical as well as repellently callous. This was regarding the presence of trans women at lesbian separatist festivals, which later would be shut down under the pressure to allow men entry. The concept of female separatism being equivalent to racism and fascism in part stems from the proliferation of the term TERF by Smith, which can be seen in the comparisons of lesbians unwilling to date trans women and of women wanting single-sex bathrooms to segregation. Female separatism is the idea that living separate from men is the best way to achieve liberation from patriarchy. There was a boom of love female and lesbian separatist communes in the 70s and 80s, but far fewer now. Today, many feminists refer to separatism as an unattainable ideal, or incorporate it into their lives on a smaller scale, such as only seeing female doctors or attending female festivals. She later compared TERFs to racists by stating, Much of the factional divide here comes down to yet another gatekeeping movement about purity and feminism, perennial since the women's suffrage movement, and this one has uncomfortable echoes of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's arguments about extending voting rights to black men. However, the term TERF itself is a misnomer. Trans-exclusionary radical feminist implies that radical feminism does not include trans individuals when it does. It includes female trans-identified individuals and excludes male trans-identified individuals. Radical feminism seeks female liberation, and just as one cannot expect the black activism or Asian activism to center around other groups, why should feminism be any different? Quite simply, the exclusion of men from radical feminism's purview is what angers trans individuals so much. It invalidates the concept of gender being innate and offends by refusing to include trans women as female and refusing to exclude trans men as male. It is no wonder that so many misunderstand criticism of trans issues as being bigoted when questioning gender ideology at all gets you branded as a turf and therefore as a valid victim for harassment, bullying, and even violence. The often misunderstood topic of intersectional feminism, which was initially coined to illustrate how experiences of womanhood could be different due to class, racial, and ethnic differences, is often used as a way to force feminism to include trans-identified men as another form of women. However, because of these different experiences, women will face different challenges and lead different lives, but will still have the common experience of being female both growing up and being socialized as female, as well as more structural and invisible aspects, such as medical misogyny. This does not mean that men who do not agree with socially imposed standards of masculinity, who do not like their male bodies, or who wish to identify as women, are actually another female experience. This also does not mean that women who disagree with and chafe under the experience of living in a patriarchal world and wish to identify out of it are not female. The conflation of race playing a difference in how women experience misogyny with trans-identified males is another common defense stemming from intersectionality, most often tied to the quote by Sojourner Truth, Ain't I a Woman, or Simone de Beauvoir's often quipped line that one is not born a woman, but rather becomes one. By doing so, the argument relies on conflating recognizing womanhood as being a female exp exclusive experience with racism. After all, if you don't think trans women are women, then how can you think black women are women? The argument itself is manipulative, but works well on those more concerned of appearing politically correct than actually being morally or factually correct. 
The use of the term intersectionality to refer to the inclusion of trans women is itself a racially loaded argument, as it was originally coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 to refer to the material reality of the intersection of sex and race, specifically regarding black girls. To use the phrase as an intellectual bludgeon to shut down conversation is to ignore that systems of power exist and are observable, with a historical and material basis that transgenderism lacks, as it has no material or clear definition and is a relatively young movement in the manner that we see today. The purpose of feminism is not to include or exclude individuals. It's not a club. It is not meant to validate one's personal choices or to create a fun little group for you to join or be excluded from. The goal of feminism is women's liberation from the patriarchy. This includes objecting to and critiquing gender roles and stereotypes, which transgenderism relies on upholding by definition. To claim that womanhood is an idea, an aesthetic or a club to join, is to downplay the female experience and the subjugation that has historically, and continues, to still occur to the female sex because they are female. The rise of the usage of the term TERF has aided in the habitual pushback to feminist gains, as transphobia is portrayed as being one of the worst types of bigotry, while misogyny is often downplayed if it's even acknowledged at all, especially in places which focus on gender identity instead of material reality. It is used as a way to shut down discussion out of fear of social faux pas, and more so for the bullying and social detriment that being called a TERF causes. TERF is used interchangeably with feminist, lesbian, and outspoken woman. It is a gendered insult similar to bitch or cunt. To pretend that it accurately describes anything, or that it holds more meaning than feminazi ever did, only plays into the gendered activism that ultimately seeks to redefine gender based on acceptance of oppression and stereotypes, which defines women by acceptance of gender roles and expectations, which expects women to be silent when men speak even if those men don't identify as such. That only women are regularly called TERFs illustrates this point. However, this hasn't stopped every critic from being labeled as a bigot, no matter how kind their criticism is. In doing so, gender ideology effectively suffocates intellectual debate and ethical questions out of fear of being labeled a bigot and facing undue consequences as a result. This is especially insidious regarding discussion of so-called gender-affirming care, which ranges from puberty blockers to hormone therapy to surgery, or more accurately, the lack of discussion due to suppression of information which opposes the minority stress model. The minority stress model is what drives gender-affirming treatment, which does not question if comorbidities may play a role in a person's distress or gender dysphoria. Instead, medical practitioners support the conclusion that the individual has come to, as the patient is supposed to be more sure of their gender than any clinician can claim to be, and ignores explanations or treatments for other issues, such as depression, anxiety, or PTSD. The theory of minority stress states that the frequently co-occurring psychiatric symptoms of gender dysphoric individuals are a result of prejudice and discrimination brought about by gender nonconformity, and that gender transition will ameliorate these symptoms. Under this model, all roads lead to Rome, and all problems an individual may have can be attributed as being a part of their gender dysphoria. Ergo, treating gender dysphoria is seen as a way to successfully treat not only depression and anxiety, but to also resolve neurocognitive deficits frequently present in gender dysphoric individuals. This spurs on the belief that transition will cure all mental health issues, and presents gender-affirming care as life-saving, as often individuals suffer from depression and suicidality, and any form of restraint upon it, as being bigoted instead of merely cautious. Additionally, the trans community itself is insular and self-polices discussion on the topic. Many social media posts illustrate a hesitancy to speak openly about regret, or downsides to medical procedures and those who detransition, who stop seeking transitioning resources, are often villainized and bullied. Surgical complications are rarely discussed, and when they are, are presented as being not a big deal. Honest discussion of the pain, healing process, and effect on standard of living after these invasive elective procedures are instead replaced with light discussion, which makes light of the true experience in favor of aestheticism. This creates an imbalanced discussion wherein someone seeking gender-affirming care will only ever find support for their decision, creating a bias that hides the negatives of such an impactful choice. Part of this is spurred on by the lie that very few people regret their transition. 
However, a 2023 study by Cohn notes that despite detransition rates being widely reported as low, the studies which make those claims often have a dearth of flaws, which, he notes, compromise the reliability of their reported rates or refer to a population with very different characteristics from the large numbers of young people contemplating or undergoing medical intervention today. Many people do not read these studies in full or are not aware of what makes a study reliable or unreliable. Cohen notes that of the studies he reviewed, many missed multiple of the following checks. Waiting long enough to observe regrets, having a small loss to follow up, using an appropriate measurement instrument, and studying a relevant sample. In other words, many of the studies which claim a lack of regret do not wait long enough to determine if these are effective treatments for gender dysphoria long term, lose too many of their subjects to have a large enough subject pool to generalize from, do not use measurement instruments relevant to what is being studied, or study a sample that is irrelevant from the question. Many of those who identify as trans today are young, receive care without long-term evaluation as a result of the gender affirmation model, and do not report back to their doctors when they decide to detransition. This also doesn't measure cases of social detransition where no medical treatment was sought. This study doesn't argue that detransition rates are high or low, but that we simply do not know how many people are detransitioning, and that many who seek to transition are falsely told that it is unlikely they will regret their choice, while denying the many detrimental side effects that come with making that decision. Hi TikTok, my name is Rory and I'm a detransitioner. I'm 23 years old and I'm about three months off of estrogen, which I took for four years. I was what you would have called true trans. I presented with dysphoria for most of my childhood um, into early adulthood. I had this very sudden, very strong realization that I was just denying my reality. And it quickly became untenable for me to continue taking hormones. Three things I wish I knew before I transitioned to male. One that injecting myself with cross-sex hormones actually was harming and damaging my perfectly healthy body. Two, that changing my identity and changing my body wasn't actually going to heal the pain I had within myself. It was just an escape that created actually more trauma for me. Three, that it was okay to be a tomboy and not fit into society's beauty standards of what a woman was supposed to be like. The pressure for gender non-conforming individuals based to conform, either with the stereotypes associated with their sex or by presenting as the other sex, alongside the bullying and ostracization that detrans individuals face creates secondary pressure. If they decide to detransition or live as a gender non-conforming person, will they lose their social groups and face incredibly harsh bullying if they are public about their choice? The quickness with which many seeking hormones are offered to trans-identified people, especially from Planned Parenthood, Tavistock, or other gender clinics, is incredibly negligent, as many trans individuals are seeking hormones and other gender-affirming care at younger and younger ages than ever before, and yet are never counseled to the extent needed to affirm that this is the right treatment choice. Instead, parents are told that their children need this path to live. Young adults are told that this is permanent, and yet a decision that they won't regret. This leads to those who transition young often facing themselves with the consequences of making a choice that children simply are incapable of comprehending. How can a 14-year-old consider the consequences of hormones when their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed? When their limbic system prevents them from having adequate impulse control or considering how their current choices would affect them in the future? And that's, of course, under the implications that these trans kids are actually in charge of their own transition but we'll discuss this in depth in a later episode. How many people truly know the impact on their health when they start taking hormones? As a result of hysterectomy or Lupron use, women face a higher risk of osteoporosis. Hysterectomy causes a higher risk of dementia. Testosterone in women also causes uterine and vaginal atrophy, which is rarely talked about and yet is a medical certainty. After a few months to a few years on testosterone, women's reproductive organs begin to atrophy inside their bodies. No woman on testosterone is exempt from this and can lead to recurrent bacterial infections which lead to kidney infections, which lead to sepsis, as well as pain. 28 studies on the long-term outcomes of medical transition have shown higher rates of suicide, alcoholism, disability, and unchanged or worse mental health. Men who undergo SRS find their promised neovaginas to be nothing like the organ it was modeled after. Neovaginals can grow hair inside the organ and require daily dilation to prevent the wound from closing. If kept open, neovaginas made with intestines will smell like intestines. 
However, both transidentifying men and women are sold the lie that their genitals will look exactly like the other sexes, and they are not warned of the pain associated with these surgeries. Puberty blockers are often suggested as a safe middle ground to allow children to explore their gender identity and prevent experiencing the wrong puberty. The primary drug used is Lupron, off-label. Lupron has been used for everything from endometriosis to prostate cancer to precocious puberty. Research from as early as 2017 found a negative impact of pubertal suppression. Another study found that puberty blockers increase depression symptoms and slow reaction time in healthy women and reduce long-term spatial memory in sheep, as well as lowering IQ, as it was found that the girls had a mean IQ of 94 as against a mean IQ of 102 for the matched control group. Even non-medical interventions like binding are unsafe. Binding refers to the practice of compressing the chest to make it appear flat or minimized. Often, there are specially made garments that are made of top material, called binders, while others use homemade methods like duct tape or medical tape. One study found out of a pool of 1,800 participants, 51.5% reported daily binding. Over 97% reported at least one of 28 negative outcomes associated to binding. Frequency was consistently associated with negative outcomes. However, this hasn't stopped Transgender Teen Survival Guide from offering advice on how to order one without parents knowing, or school officials from giving students binders in secret. Exploring non-medical treatments itself is controversial, as anything that is not in full-on support of transition results in backlash. However, while many argue that gender dysphoria can only be treated via physical transition, the rising rates of detransitioners raises concerns. Dr. Hilary Cass, a pediatrician who was leading an independent review of the services Tavistock provides, found earlier this year that the clinic, as the only provider of gender identity services for young people in England, was not a safe or viable long-term option. In 2022, the Tavistock Clinic was ordered to be shut down due to safety concerns, particularly due to fears that the doctors were too quick to affirm a child's new identity without looking at other mental health or medical issues. A similar trend is yet to follow in the United States, though many medical professionals have raised concerns about this treatment model and the efficacy of these treatments, many of which have no longitudinal studies to determine if they work long term. Studies which support these concerns are rarely shared within the trans community or to them from medical professionals who provide those services. There is a concerted effort to prevent trans-identified individuals from truly understanding what they are signing up for when they transition, both from what transition really is to what they can realistically expect as a result of undergoing that path. This dedication to ignorance also extends to ignoring the danger of self-ID. Self-identification allows anyone to identify as another sex and forces the public to recognize them as such, even if they have undergone no treatment to transition. It is because of this policy that incidents like We Spa occurred, wherein the business would face a lawsuit if they did declare the intruder to be a man invading a woman's bath and removed him, and thus had to allow a sex offender to remain in the space with vulnerable women and girls despite their discomfort. Advocates argue that there is no danger in this policy and that this will save lives by removing requirements to undergo psychological evaluation or to take medical steps to detransition or to pass. As Susanna Rustin puts it, it is dangerous to pretend that female people are not vulnerable in specific ways to male violence and other forms of social control. Statements such as, our lives should not be defined by the bodies we are born with, in the final report, are in my view irresponsible as well as untrue. Of course, the bodies we are born with, including the reproductive parts, define our lives in some ways. This is reality, not sexist essentialism. The fact that gender expression is becoming more fluid does not negate the importance of sexual characteristics. This is true for the growing number of young people with gender dysphoria, as much as for anyone else. Arguably, there is no group for whom it is more important to be clear about human sexual and reproductive functions than those who may seek to alter their bodies using drugs or surgery. All of this circles back to the desire to usurp sex with gender and language, and in terms of importance. You cannot change your sex. Even if you are infertile, even if you get sex organs removed, even if you are intersex, your entire body is formed in a specific way according to your sex. You can change secondary sex characteristics, you can change gender presentation, but this does not change that women and girls have historically and continue today to have specific experiences due to their sex. It does not change that sex-based violence exists, from honor killings to period huts to decreased pay and the triple burden, to the demographics of sexual assault. It does not change that men and women react differently to medical procedures, to medicine, or have different needs which impact the creation of infrastructure. And yet, the trans community often presents sex as unimportant and gender as of greater importance. 
stating this, namely in the argument of the importance of maintaining single-sex spaces, sports, and opportunities for women, is often portrayed as transphobic. Transphobic is the catch-all, shut-down word which has served well in silencing even the most milk toast of discussion on these topics. If you look at what is considered transphobic, you'll find a list that varies from biological sex is real and immutable to men with penises should not be incarcerated with women. Questioning the current medical course of giving hormones on a first visit, or whether girls who are uncomfortable with their bodies should be counseled for experiencing misogyny before treating gender dysphoria, is not bigotry. It's critical thinking regarding a process that has left many unsatisfied, facing health complications, and has put others at risk. That is not to say that trans people do not face pushback or undue hardship, but I argue that transphobia, as the term is often used, does not exist. Either a trans woman passes or a trans man does not and faces misogyny, or a trans person doesn't pass and is viewed as gender nonconforming and gay and in turn faces homophobia. These are not new terms of bigotry, but some of the oldest existing. Pretending that there is a new form of bigotry that we must urgently address places transgenderism as an oppressed class above others, even though what they face is nothing new and, importantly, 65% of trans adults in the U.S. are white, leaving many to question if the sudden rise in transgenification may be linked to social movements which have placed minorities at the forefront and asked white individuals to check their privilege. Identifying as trans places one in a category of oppressed minority and thus removes the need to self-improve under identity politics, which views how you identify and how oppressed you are as more important than how you act. Controlling language goes beyond an expectation to add your pronouns to your email byline. The social pressure to conform punishes any deviance in every avenue of life. You can't criticize it. You can't openly state your opinions. You can't discuss the negatives. You can only be blankly, submissively positive. No other social movement has been afforded the same control. No other minority group has been given this kind of power. How can women discuss female experiences or hope to have their perspective heard if the word woman becomes meaningless? Even those who are apolitical are affected. The induction of inclusive language as a replacement for clear language, namely using uterus or cervix havers in healthcare, is confusing to many. Not just those who have English as a second language, but those with brain injuries or learning disabilities, and to be quite honest, the broader American population. Reading, writing, and math are three of the most important skills taught in public school systems as they offer the foundation required for higher education and learning, even beyond the boundaries of traditional schooling. However, in recent years, it seems as if the ability to interpret what one reads, to critically examine what one consumes, and to make judgments based off of that information are becoming lost skills. One only has to look at their social media feeds to see how much misinformation is being spread uncritically, and opinion presented as fact, often without challenge. Reading especially is an important skill in determining if the information you're being told is true, for whom it benefits for you to believe such things, as well as to know as if you are being manipulated. This is because there is a strong relationship between the ability to read and the ability to critically think, which is best illustrated through the impact of declining literacy rates in the U.S. amongst the rise of misinformation and populism. When the ability to make one's own judgments based on factual analysis becomes a rare skill, so too does the ability to think independently. Worse still, more and more people rely on others to interpret the world around them, which makes it easy to influence the public through key control of a few highly trusted figures via their power of authority. A 2019 study ranked the U.S. as 125th for literacy, while data collected by the U.S. Department of Education published in 2020 found that 130 million adults in the country have low literacy skills. In other words, more than half, 54% of Americans between the ages of 16 and 74 read below the equivalent of a 6th grade level. This data is now 4 years old, leaving many to wonder how the pandemic may have impacted these numbers due to the challenges of teaching over the pandemic, particularly in rural areas and for impoverished families who, according to a recent study by Soland et al., were 30% less likely to log on for online learning than those of high-income families. This issue occurs even in higher-level education, where assessing the impact of COVID-19 and academic dishonesty in higher education by Kishore Kumar Das reports finding a significant increase in cheating behaviors during the COVID-19 pandemic. This lack of reading comprehension and critical thinking skills is likely a major cause of why many of the coercive tactics used in the community go unchecked, and why so many gains have happened in such a short amount of time, 
unlike many other social movements, and often in direct conflict to both rationalism and the rights of other minorities. What this leads to is many Americans being left behind by the constantly changing language which caters to gender ideology. This process of replacing clear, simple language with more inclusive alternatives can be referred to as semantic gentrification. Dave Hewitt coined the term in his 2024 article. He writes, There's a phenomenon I've noticed in political discourse many times in recent years, which goes like this. An existing term is colonized and its meaning subverted to new political ends. Previous users of the term are forced to come up with a new term to replace the old one. The new occupants demonize the old and deny political legitimacy to any new terminology. The best description I can think of for this process is semantic gentrification, in which users of a word's original meaning are forced out by newcomers who consider themselves morally enlightened in comparison to the older population, who completely change the character of the term in service of their own narrow interests, and who regard the now homeless former inhabitants with contempt. Inherent in this is a sense in which the new meaning is superior to the old, representing a progressive, moral inevitability, and that attempts to reassert old meanings are denied legitimacy as regressive, backwards, and on the wrong side of history. Why would you want to hold on to a run-down, backwards, old semantic neighborhood when the shiny new hipster takeover is such a clear improvement? More than just a straightforward language shift where a term changes or becomes emptied of meaning over time, this is much more of an explicit takeover. A subversion and destruction of language as a clear exercise of the power of the colonizers, appropriating whatever goodwill exists towards the original semantic structures, while those who are usurped are both ostracized and unable to clearly articulate their position. And since this process is invariably in service of men's needs and interests, that really puts the gent in gentrification. Quite simply, language shapes how we view and interact with the world around us. It is how we communicate and connect with other people. It is how we spread ideas. It is how we foster change. By creating a stronghold on language, both from the words we use to the silencing of dissent, gender ideology has managed to create a stronghold on what is considered liberal and kind, and in turn, has greatly changed the world we live in to better suit their narrative. I hope that this episode has served as an entry point to the often ill-discussed world of gender ideology and offered insight as to what is truly at stake. Hence the title of this podcast. In the yellow wallpaper, a woman slowly goes insane as a consequence of being confined to a room and denied dignity. Although times have changed, the stifling of female intellectualism still runs rampant as we can see throughout this episode. This theme is a recurring one across many topics and one which we will discuss throughout this podcast. In our next episode, we will discuss the impact that gender ideology has had on women's rights, women's spaces, and women's safety. If you are interested in providing an antidote, story, complaint, or comment, please leave a voicemail at 872-210-4966 to be featured on the show. Calling in is confidential, and you do not have to leave a name, number, or any identifying information. Voicemails can be as long or short as you wish. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and subscribers, and I'll talk to you soon.